Good afternoon everyone. Well here we go again on another question and answer and a bit of an update. It's been an interesting week but not a, a dramatic week which is kind of nice. It means everything's running reasonably smoothly. Um, the uh, the big news I suppose, uh, Jean-Luc still out there holding on to his lead. Certainly no indications that I'm seeing that he's slowing up. It's just as if Philippe Peche is there giving him a hard time and he's going for it. So uh, Jean-Luc is uh, obviously feeling confident in the boat. He's had a pretty good run with the weather this this week no huge seas that were a problem he's always been able to carry on uh, to the east so making good time towards Hobart um, Mark Sinclair he's had a few uh, little challenges this week I suppose some more uncomfortable seas uh, that middle group got hammered by a bit of a blow this week and uh, uh, some of the worst seas that Mark's seen um, he's uh, spoken on the phone call which is a really interesting listen this this month this week if you haven't listened to it yet talking about the issue of his sail bags not being that you know big enough to get sails in easy sometimes he's got to drag them down below makes everything a bit wet so um, you know getting a bit sort of crazy and he's also worried about his uh, halyards a bit there's a bit of chafe there maybe inside or some drag some restrictions so he's going to look at doing something when he gets to Hobart with that um, then we've got Gregor Gregor's just going for it you know he's sounds like a hungry young man at the moment trying to catch Mark so there's a real race going on there and he's made some ground you know he's only at the moment 170 miles behind him and uh, that's going to be interesting to watch over the next week or two as they head in he had an oil spill just half a litre of cooking oil spilled in the boat caught causing him all sorts of little hassles and, and uh, quite annoying trying to clean it up he's slipping around inside the boat and so on and uh, on his hydrovane wind vane some bolts started some nuts started to get a bit loose and uh, he's tightened them up now but that's just normal maintenance so uh, it's all working fine um, so generally yeah he's um, he's just doing everything he needs to do to get get back here safely and uh, try and catch up to Mark so that's fun Tommy huge grounds in the last week another big gain from the week before so over the last three weeks or so uh, he's gained something like 600 miles 550 miles um, from where he was previously and he's really right on top of Gregor and in fact it looks like by the end of today uh, Tommy will be uh, in third place position so um, that's very exciting because she's a Shuhaley replica. Uh, Gregor is the Biscay 36. I've spoken about this on the on the, my thoughts section, and uh, Mark's in a in a Rustler 36. So there's a real tussle going on there. Um, uh, Uku uh, coming up uh, behind that lot. He's about 160 miles. No, about 200 miles behind. Relatively quiet. It's sort of. I think Uku's doing it tough at the moment. Not. You know, obviously it's hard work driving the boat and keep it all going, but he's just feeling a little bit quiet and subdued. You know, it's, a, it's just a sense, you know, his, his text messages and the phone call, um, it's hard work and um, he's, he's having to cope with that. So, uh, but he's keeping up there. He's not moving as fast as um, Gregor and, uh, uh, and uh, Tommy, but he's still there in a good position. Then we go through to the, the middle, middle ground, uh, you know, to the tail end of group, and that's in, led by Susie, of course. Susie's concentrating. She's, she's got an objective. She's got to try and keep the pressure on and do everything she can to get forward. You know, she's still racing mode. You can see that. Good news is the boat seems fine. Um, you know, in fact, that's the same with uh, even the, the um, middle fleet. I, I didn't mention boats there, but generally they're all cool. You know, Uku's not mentioning a problem. Um, Tommy had, uh, what happened there? He had a problem with his wind vane, uh, broke a, a conrod on the, um, on the wind vane, but fixed that. Um, just little things. So all the boats looking okay. Susie never mentions a problem. She's a bit like Jean-Luc. Her preparation really was good. Um, you know, you talk to her and she's, yeah, fine, you know, and she's sounding a bit better. She's happy to be on the move. So, so watch this space. She's certainly not out of the game. She's a weather system behind um, the middle middle fleet. But even if that maintained itself all the way through to Cape Horn, which it could do, it's really uh, that sort of game. There's a chance to do something in the Atlantic. So all of these boats are you know not too far out of reach. Maybe Jean Luc's a long way, but we'll see what happens. Um, then Istvan and uh, uh, Tapio, they're having fun. You know they're still side by side. They both know that. Um, and um, Istvan is, uh, he's got, still got some issues with his uh, wheel drum. The rest of it's just little things. Boat seems to be fine. He's very happy as usual. He's happy with his position because he's made up heaps when you look back over the, over the past weeks. 
and he's in the game again. He's racing. He's, he's having fun. And, and Tapio, his batteries are slowly coming up. He doesn't care about the rest of it. He's a sailor. I've mentioned this before. Um, he'd be happy to go with no electronics, and he'd just sail around like Sue Haley. So he's he's um, right into it. He's enjoying the beauty. He often talks about this whole, you know, the environment that he's in, and the, the you know the, we all know it's a huge wilderness area, the Southern Ocean, and and he's lapping it up. So um, so happy there. Um, Esmeralda, okay. Uh, some great reports coming now. You may not have picked up on this. When he does a phone call, it's all ooh, 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 Russian, okay, Spasiba, all that. But a day later, usually, we'll get a full interpretation of that. Uh, the Russian team there, um, they're interpreting the, um, the conversation into English and they're great reads. We've had a couple of them out now, so try and remember to look for that on Facebook. Um, it tells a great story, so we're finally getting some colour for, from Igor, and he's happy as, you know, he's just cruising along. He's a classic Russian seaman, you know, good sailor. He's lucked out on a few things, and he's away at the back of the fleet, but what the hell, you know, he's there, and he's, and he's moving forward, and, and he's all about finishing. Um, Loik, what a great stop, you know, just that's, that's Loik all over. He's a true Corinthian. He made his uh, pit stop into Cape Town. It all was reasonably successful. He felt really comfortable. And by the look of his course, if you haven't seen the, um, the tracker update I did this morning, it's really clever. He's obviously plotted a, a sail plan before he left to cut just the right area where the current was and manage those strong winds that he had. Um, that suggests to me that he's really organised and uh, it's a cool boat, you know. And so he's gained some confidence now to carry on with the next leg through the Southern Ocean. Captain Coconut, uh, <laughs> he's having a holiday now. He's doing a scenic cruise along the bottom of uh, Cape Town there. Again, you have two options when you leave Cape Town. One is to head due south before you head to Tasmania over there and get underneath the Agullis Current. The other one is to take a punt and stick close to the coast and then try and stick your head out and cut it at 90 degrees. Now he's taken that option. There's always the risk that you can get caught in really bad weather in the strongest part of the Agullis current. And I'm not sure how that's shaping up yet. He's gonna go into a period of calms, so he'll slow down a bit. And a couple of days away, there's a big blow, you know, some strong winds, I should say, coming in exactly the opposite direction to the current. So he may luck out there. We've just gotta wait and see how that evolves. But it's worth watching on the tracker and pull your currents up, you know, on the windy TY, hit the currents, you'll see what's going on there. So, um, so yeah, interesting things going on and, and uh, uh, yeah, an interesting race uh, and a great adventure. Um, I should mention I've got no, be it, no um, GGR shirt on today. This is La Sable Delone Agglomeration shirt, our great partners, and I'm always uh, appreciative every day we go into the office. It's at the marina there. It's great. But on, uh, if you're watching this from La Sable Delone on Tuesday morning at nine o'clock, uh, we're having a briefing, a public and media briefing there. It's gonna become a regular monthly thing, so it's open to anyone. You can come along and you can ask us questions. The team will be there. Uh, we'll talk about everything to do with the race. But also just looking forward to the um, Hobart um, uh, boat shed film drop that we're gonna have there. Um, obviously, Jean-Luc is in the lead. It's going to be an interesting story. We'll do a similar thing to what we did in uh, the Rubicon Marina Lanzarote film drop in the Canaries, where we'll be live Facebooking everything. You can follow it all from there. But in the case of Jean-Luc, for the people in the Saab Delone, it'll be big news. So we're, we're planning a big uh, do at the, um, at the race office here next to the Vendee Marina. And you'll be able to come there whatever time it is, 24 hours a day, we will do the live Facebook thing for everyone else in English, but then we'll stop for five, 10 minutes and we'll open it up again. It'll all be in French. It'll be broadcast onto the big screen in the office. Um, the media and the people in the office or in the media center there will be able to ask questions to John Luke. It's a different stream. Uh, we will then pose those questions to John Luke. He will answer and talk specifically to you in the uh, in the media center office there. So uh, whatever time it is here in France, it could be two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Who knows what? Uh, it'll happen. So and then each as each of the other boats come through, we'll be doing the same as we did in Lanzarote. You know, we were at Rubicon Marina film drop. So uh, keep an eye out for the boat shed uh, uh, Hobart film drop. That'll be fun. Anyway, going straight into the questions. Uh, first one was from Mike Phillips. 
I wanted to know why we restricted the, the uh, designs to monohulls in the way we have. What's wrong with multi-hulls? I mean, Nigel Tetley did really well around the world back in those days. It's a very simple answer. Uh, basically, a multi-hull and a, and a monohull is like a car and a motorbike. Call it what you like. They're not the same, completely different principles. And two parts to this event, uh, it's all about celebrating the performance and the achievement of Sue Haley and Sir Robin Knox Johnson winning the first event. So we've got similar boats. Secondly, we want it to be a race and an event, which is what's happening. Put one multi-hull in there and you think John Luke is fast? <laughs> the multi-hull's probably already gone past Hobart and on his way to Cape Horn. It just doesn't work. You know, you've got to decide this event's not for everyone, but for those that are involved, it's fantastic. We're really happy. So we just don't mix them. We love multi-hulls. Don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, um, you know, the Altums and all the, all the fast boats out there. I mean, it's pretty cool. Very exciting, great to watch and, and so on, but it doesn't fit in, in the scheme of this event. Um, as far as we've defined it for being the Golden Globe. Uh, another interesting one, uh, funny one from Eric Ricky. Um, has Jessica Watson shown any interest, interest in the 2022 uh, GGR? I haven't asked her, but I doubt it because <laughs> uh, um, she's moved on to other things. She's still sailing a lot. Jessica Watson being the, the youngest solo non-stop around the world by the capes and so on. Um, and uh, a girl that we supported and a great friend, you know. So, uh, but yeah, she's not planning to come and race me at all in, in 2022. I had an interesting discussion with Mike Golding this week about the, um, the way we manage the phone conversations. And he was asking and suggesting that we should make it more of an interview, ask more personal questions, uh, uh, try and get in-depth uh, analysis from them on certain things. And uh, he, he believes it would be great for the followers. And, and I've got to say, um, then said, why don't we do that? Um, you're not, Mike's not alone in this because we get lobbied by media, um, journalists wanting us to ask questions for them and so on. We can never do that. If you remember the principle, we say quite clearly we don't have um, satellite phone communication on the boat. They're not allowed to ring anyone. It's a safety aid, and it is. Uh, it's a check-in once a week to make sure their phones are working, they know how to use their phones, and also to get a brief on how they're feeling, what their boat is, and, and so on. It gives us an insight. Um, we're not turning it into a media interview. Uh, we know how to run a media interview, but we, we don't do that. We tend to um, let them tell us and talk to us on how they're feeling, what they're doing, and we ask basic questions and let them respond. Often they're yes, no questions, but they'll add to that. Um, and so if we did do proper media interviews, then we would, you know, that's basically like using a satellite phone like everyone else in the world does, and, and that's not what we want to achieve. So it's a great point, but it's just something we don't allow. We, we don't even give them information. The only information we give them is what's happening to other boats that have withdrawn or moved to another class or, or things like that. So, um, um, so that's the answer to that one. Uh, James Buskard um, wanted to know about the, he noticed the boats coming through Lanzarote, the Rubicon film drop there, that they had poles sticking out either side, like Philippe Peche when he came through had two poles out and Mark Slats had similar. And he was wondering what they were for. Were they similar to the Vendee Globe boats where they have the big poles sticking out? And no, they're not. Uh, the Vendee boats, you've probably seen them, uh, they have carbon fibre masts and they have these big poles. And that's actually part of their sort of standard standing rigging to help keep the mast up. You'll notice that it increases their, what you'd call their, it's not their spreader base, but it's the uh, angle and the uh, loads on the rigging because they don't have, you'll see there's virtually no spreaders on there. So to do that, you need a big shroud base, you know, to get the same sort of power to hold the rig there. So the Vendee is all about the standing rigging. And uh, some of them have, well, they used to have rotating masts and so on as well, and that helps that. Um, on the GGR boats, it's running twin head sails, and each sailor's got a different interpretation and different uh, way of running downwind with various sail combinations. Mark Slats had one which was two sails on one luff, or hard wide to, or hard connection to the force day, and he'd use two poles to hold it out, specifically for those heavy uh, downwind conditions that they were getting with the wind squeeze between the islands in the Canaries. So uh, it's, it's just running poles, that's it. Uh, and as I say, some use one pole, pole out the, the windward head sail and loose, loose foot the, um, the leeward head sail, still running twins, there's different combinations. Um, Margaret Keyes, um, is, she was asked her, uh, my opinion if there's a common denominator between great sailors like Slocum, Chichester, Robin Knox Johnson, uh, Voss, all that sort of stuff, and the way they behave at sea with the seamanship. And this is, you know, I mean, I've read all the books and I sort of, um, you know, seen what they, what they did and how they did it. 
Um, certainly there's a huge difference between Slocum and Robin Ox Johnson and uh, uh, some of the, you know, Chichester because of the challenge that they were doing, the boats they had and, um, uh, and the, the, the time frame, you know, the equipment was different. The boats, are, you know, some real basic with Slocum back to um, Chichester was quite advanced at the time, sort of. So if anything, I'd have to say, first of all, they were passionate about what they're doing. You know, they, Chichester, um, he was a master of the media. He, he was a great adventurer in the air and on the water. Um, Robin Ox Johnson was a, the, the quintessential seaman, you know, um, all that sort of stuff. But they, had, they were driven. They were driven people. They had a real desire and, and drive to achieve something strong. So they were real achievers. Um, Slocum was groundbreaking. You know, when he took off, there was no such thing as autopilots. And he had this little old boat that he picked up off the beach and fixed it up. And it was like a fishing boat. So it's very hard to try and re relate them all into being different categories or or um, how they did it. But the bottom line is they did it well. You know, they achieved their goals and, and uh, um, you know, that's about as much as I can say to it. You know, it's, it's very hard to say they're all similar in any particular way other than being driven to achieve something quite special. And it was a very personal thing, um, you know, so, so that's um, the best I can do on that. Um, okay, so Will Joshua, um, uh, on the track, uh, um, case, oh, I can't even read my own writing again here. Um, I might have to come back to that one. Okay, Rob Havel. Uh, will Coconut be sailing along to Tahiti <laughs> instead of carrying on? Um, I'm not sure. He is definitely at one with the sea. Uh, I don't know whether he's philosophical. He's having a good time and he's certainly not in a hurry. He's uh, stated quite categorically that he's out there to enjoy the ride, not push the boat, make sure he finishes. And he's trying to make sure he's here by April the 22nd, which is the uh, prize giving for the race. And uh, I think he'll make it in that time. I'm not sure. He's saying now that he's going to arrive in Hobart on uh, November the 15th. And I did a quick calculation, even on his own timing, it's looking like he's going to arrive more like the 10th or, or earlier, but he says he's going to meet up with his daughter there. So, um, uh, so maybe he'll slow down again. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, watch this space. Um, Guy Waits was asking, um, Robin Ox Johnson uh, felt that he'd set sail too early uh, when he set off from England. Um, and uh, if that's the case, why did we start as early as we did? Um, Robin knew he started early because he had a little boat and he had to get her all the way down and through the Southern Ocean and over to Cape Horn in the middle of summer. So yes, he knew he was early, but it wasn't a problem. He had to leave on that, t that day to do it and it worked out okay. Um, we actually left a couple of weeks later than that. Um, we knew we'd be faster. We figured we'd be down there a week before him, the fleet. And as it turns out, Jean-Luc got down a couple of weeks before his actual real time. So we're only, we're only two weeks before Robin. Um, it's not a huge difference, you know. Some people uh, think that it's a major problem. I don't think it is because uh, the boats are well found, the people are good. Um, the storm that uh, got Ari wasn't really what I call a, a catastrophic major groundbreaking storm. It was, it was just a typical Southern Ocean do, you know, 35 knots, uh, six meter seas, seven meter seas. Um, it was a combination of a lot of things. So, so our start time was, was uh, reasonable. You know, we, we looked at all that. And there was obviously the historic connection as well. We didn't want to move too far away from it. And so it all worked uh, okay. They're down there, the weather's looking okay. You know, they're, uh, um, they're plodding along and they're very capable. Um, okay, even Yvonne uh, Coolen, um, could you could explain how they harvest rainwater without salt. Uh, well, it's pretty simple. Um, you can only do it at certain times, but if there is a lot of salt there, you wait until the first lot of rain falling washes the salt away. Um, I asked Gregor, Gregor got 80 litres of water this week. He used his mizzen to collect the, collect the, the rainwater. And uh, you can do it even without touching your sails, depending on where the rain's coming from. Uh, it just Maybe sometimes you can just lift the topping lift up a bit, get the boom up if here's the mast and the water hits the sail, comes down to the boom, runs along and you just stick a bucket under the, the gooseneck area and you'll, you'll top it up real quick. So he, uh, he got 80 litres of water and uh, you know if you use your mainsail, it's even a lot more. So they've got different ways, it's not, it's not hard at all. And um, yeah, I think they'll get plenty of water on the way around. Um, uh, Margaret Keys again, uh, please explain Jean-Luc straight track, no course deviation. Well, he is tracking really straight. He's going basically due west and his ability to do that is determined by the weather. He's been, uh, 
he was the first one to get in, get away from the Cape of Good Hope and the, the, that unstable area there. So uh, that gave him typical, you know, maybe a bit more simple uh, uh, Southern Ocean weather. And he's just been lucky. There's, uh, he'll make the best course he can. There's no, there's no trick to it. Um, it's just what the weather delivers. Um, okay, Pentel Porrel, uh, early developments. So, okay. We're talking about developments of, um, uh, you know, ease of handling and sail handling and so on, you know, bringing your, ha your mainsail gear back to the cockpit using head sail furling. He's saying, well, would we allow a junk rig boat into the GGR? And the short answer is, to the best of my knowledge, no. Main and only because you have to have a, a production yacht designed before 1988 that's had it, it's got to be female molded from a mold with at least, you know, around about 20 boats pulled from that mold. Um, and then once you've got that, you have to maintain the same height of the mast and you've got to have the same spreaders, uh, the same chain plates and so on. And you can't just take that out and stick a junk rig in because you can't go lesser strength. And we don't want to get into the argument which is the stronger mast, a freestanding or, or one that's got stays on it and so on. So um, we wouldn't allow a junk rig in purely on the basis that it doesn't fit within the parameters of a standard production boat. There's no junk rig production boats at the moment of that nature. Um, so no, it wouldn't work. I like junk rig. I, I've actually bought a boat once, a Northerner 29, um, part of... Um, uh, you know, it was it had a full junk rig. I was going to do the Jester Challenge on it, but I, another adventure got in the way, so I sold it to a friend of mine, and he went up through the Northwest Passage. Junk rig is really sensible in some aspects, and of course, it was in the first GGR as well um, with Bill King. You know, his boat uh, was a fantastic uh, experiment at the time and advancement, but it, but unfortunately, lost his masts and so on. So uh, um, that's the story there. Okay. Uh, Okay, here's one, another question. What will be, uh, or what will be the spread of the boats at the finish? So when, when the boats are turning up here, I'm not sure how many will turn up, but when they turn up, what's going to be the gap between first and last? Well, I think the last will probably mark Sinclair in Coconut because that's what he's planning to do. Um, and hopefully that'll be on April the 22nd. The first is probably going to be early at February. I'm not sure exactly how early. Um, so that'll February, March, April, that'll tell you. It's around about two months between the, the whole group and it'll be um, interesting to see what happens there. Um, okay, Malcolm Collins, uh, medical checkups. Do we, all the entrants have to go through a medical checkup, and he wants to know what level we take this past history and where would we say no if someone's had a heart attack, you know, sort of six months before, or, you know, if they're way overweight or way underweight or whatever, uh, what would it take for us to knock them out? Um, all of those things wouldn't worry us. What, what we look for is for their current fitness and current health at the time of the about to start the race. Um, and anything that becomes, as long as it's not something that's likely to affect them during the course of the race, and even then we would usually leave a lot of that decision to the skipper within reason, um, we would view a health issue potentially as a disability, all right? And in the nature of a disability, if we had a disabled sailor come along to do the GGR, that's not gonna knock them out just because they're disabled it would be driven by their ability to meet all the other requirements of the GGR. So disability and medical disability, for us, it's very similar. Okay, so uh, normally, because um, as you know, um, uh, Igor had a heart attack uh, sometime just before the, you know, six months before, uh, you know, and he got through all that, he did all the stress tests and everything shaped up fine, looks good. We're inclusive rather than exclusive in terms of things like disabilities um, and medical conditions. But there, I suppose, if I had, I wouldn't even want to go to, you know, what's a typical explanation of what we would knock back on a military, uh, on a medical grounds. Um, it's not worth discussing, you know, in that sense. But certainly heart attacks, you know, being overweight, being underweight, all that stuff doesn't worry us. You know, it's their ability, their drive, their passion. And as long as it's not reckless, they, they're good to go as long as the doctor signs them off and things like that. Um, okay, Shane Rowe. Um, given the fact that uh, boats are going to, you know, go, they're going through the Southern Ocean, they're going to get knocked down. Some of them are going to get rolled over, touch wood or may get rolled over. Um, on that, in that case, do we ask for a what's called a high uh, uh, um, angle of vanishing stability? 
Okay, now angular vanishing stability is, uh, you know, you go to a point uh, of about, say, there's 90 degrees, you go down to about 110 degrees, and at that point in calm water, the boat's got to come back up again. And if you get on most yacht races now, most yachts now are good for about 130 to 135, 140 degrees. You can go right up, you know, past 90 degrees and let the boat go, it'll come up right again. We don't, we don't go through any of that, um, mainly because we know all of the boats in the general concept that we've taken with the long keel, uh, minimum displacement 6,200 kilograms, um, designed before 1988. Uh, these are wholesome, really cool boats with usually very strong ballast ratios, all that sort of stuff. It's not complicated, it's very simple. If it looks right, it probably is right. If it's been sailing forever like that, it, it's good, great re track record. We don't get into um, construction standards, we don't get into uh, uh, stability moments, all those sorts of things, we leave that uh, is a general principle. All the boats that we are ticking the boxes for to, for, to do the GGR are, are relatively safe. Um, okay, Oliver Shamrock, uh, delay. Oh, what's the? He brought up an interesting point. When you the, the delay between the entrant making a satellite tweet to when we put it up. Okay, because sometimes it's obvious that when you see the satellite tweet and it might just pop up straight away. Um, it looks old because the weather they're talking about, they'll say, oh, I've got the worst season I've got for forever. And then you look at the track and say, hang on a minute, that went through 24 hours ago or 12 hours ago or something like that. So here's the process. The entrant writes a tweet up and sends it. It might not go at that instant. It might be delayed for an hour or whatever it is, um, but usually it's within, within from the time they press the send button to um, the time we get it, it's usually within half an hour or so. Okay. When it comes in, we get it as an email. All right. Now, if we're all asleep, no one's looking at that email. Okay. Um, when we wake up and we see the email, the first thing that happens is we then put it up on their, their tweet that you'll see on Twitter or you'll see on the tweets listed in the GGR website. Okay. And that's the first bit where it goes up. The next thing that happens, so it might not be instant. If, if, that was sent, uh, if that was sent at like 10 o'clock at night, local time in France, you might not see that on, uh, on our website until about uh, uh, 8.30 the next morning. So it's already old, okay? So when that day comes through, you get the tweets for, that came through during the night. They go up online during the day, okay? And, and so that tweet that was written at 10 o'clock the night before, right, that's now... Uh, on the tweet during the day, when you see the summary of tweets that go up on Facebook at the end of the day, I usually put them up late in the day um, and someone's condensed them. Uh, either Jane has, or Celine has translated into French, you know, as well. And I'll get them. That might have been done at, say, 7 o'clock and I'll put them up at, uh, uh, you know, later that day. But that's for the whole day. So you only get those ones on Facebook the whole day. So some of those Facebook ones could be 18 and at worst even 24 hours old. That's, that's sort of how it works. That's the best we can do. There is no way to link the tweets, satellite tweets coming straight from the boat, straight onto Twitter or straight onto Facebook. So there, there is a delay there. You've got to, so that was a very good question. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, nearly finished here. Um, Peter was um, asking about, um, oh, I can't even, oh, the wind vanes again. Just uh, one last question on the wind vanes. He was asking, um, what's, the, what's my honest opinion about the best wind vanes to use? Uh, is it the auxiliary rudder type or is it the servo pendulum type? And which is the best for the GGR type boats? Uh, bottom line is they both have advantages, the concepts of auxiliary rudder and uh, um, uh, servo pendulum. And uh, you know, it depends on the boat. If you've got a really modern, fast boat with a fin keel and a rudder, sometimes a survey pendulum can react a bit faster, okay? And it's certainly very powerful, so that can be good. Um, and if you've got a traditional cruising boat or you want an auxiliary rudder or uh, you, you know, I mean, you're just happy to use, use your ship's tiller to act as a trim tab if you want to drive the boat fast, there's some real advantages for an auxiliary rudder system. Um, so for the GGR boats, this is my personal opinion, and everyone's got a different different cut on this. I believe that the um, uh, the auxiliary rudder system has some real advantages, especially for this sort of event, because they're long keel, full-bodied boats that are really powerful. 
So the first of all, they track reasonably well. Therefore, the auxiliary rudder doesn't have to work too hard. Secondly, if you want to race and overload the boat, you can use your ship's steering or ship's rudder to uh, uh, add some, like a trim tab, add some helm, and then lock it off, right? So you can stop your ship's rudder because when you engage the hydrovane type gear, um, it's going to steer the boat now with that little bit of a trim on it, which helps you to go a little bit faster maybe. It's a very simple system. It's foolproof. It keeps working. Jean-Luc hasn't had a problem. Um, we heard from Gregor some loose nuts today. Just tighten the nuts up. That's like on your car, you know, if your wheel nuts are getting wobbly, tighten them up. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was going to go with a hydrovane if I had done this on a Tradewind 35. Um, certainly nothing wrong with servo pendulum systems. If I had to choose my personal best wind vanes, uh, it's either a hydrovane or an Aries. And don't forget the Fleming. People in this part of the world don't know the Fleming. That's a really good vane. And the monitor, they're all good. Uh, they're my priorities, you know. I'd, I'd say hydrovane, Aries, uh, Fleming and uh, monitor. And if, you know, I was going to do it a, with a hydrovane. <laughs> so, okay, that's about it. Um, thank you, and we'll um, see you again next week. Uh, like and share if you think it's cool, because the more people we get following the race, the better. And thanks for all the compliments that um, we've been getting. Lots of emails still. And remember our Citran bear. You can always get to Citran uh, um, through the website. Go for the charity. Thanks for that. See you later.